an ancient city rises. The most wicked city on earth. The prophets said it would be destroyed. They were right. It has never been rebuilt. Yet the ancient prophets saw her rising. And then the world ends. Babylon rising. Do you know what's coming? Hello and welcome to Babylon Rising. My name is Yves Bonnier and I am your host for this wonderful journey here. I would like to first uh, welcome all of our guests here at the Cashman Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am so glad that you are here, but I don't want to forget all of our friends who are watching online or on television. I discovered something interesting this morning that we even have a group watching in Babylon, New York. <laughs> and so I want to say welcome to all of you as well in Babylon, New York. John Bradshaw has such a gift to be able to open God's Word and make it so crystal clear. Have you been blessed by the daily messages? Amen. I'm, I'm kind of sad today, and that's, it's not because New Zealand prevailed in our poll yesterday. <laughs> I'm over that. But I'm sad because today is part four, the final part of our Babylon Rising journey. All good things seem to come to an end on earth. But I've got some good news because John Bradshaw is going to do a longer series. He's going to flesh out a lot of the things that he's presented during Babylon Rising during a longer series that starts, and you want to mark your calendar, it starts on Friday, January 20, 2012. And let me tell you this, a lot of good stuff is going to be shared then. It's a great way to start the new year. We want to offer some resources to you. People are asking, you know, we, we, we're just so enjoying what we're hearing. Our, our interest has been pricked. We, we want to learn more. And so there's a couple of things that you can do that will help you in learning a whole lot more from what you have already learned. Number one, go to our website, Babylon is Rising. And there, there is a tab that says Bible Studies. So you may want to go there and just push that tab and sign up for Bible studies, for deeper, more involved study of the Bible. Also, right off the press, and this is hot because it's so off the press, is this book called Babylon Rising by John Bradshaw. And we want to make sure that you check this out. It's available for you as well. Some of the things that John was not able to present during Babylon Rising are right here in this book. Well, I just love the violin. To be truthful, it's probably one of my very favorite instruments. And so when I discovered Jamie George was coming, I was very, very excited. He is so gifted. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when he plays, he can reach such high notes in a way that is so enjoyable. And we're glad that he is here today. And, uh, and not only for Babylon Rising, but we've arranged for him to be in concert tonight, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And those of you who want to watch him online, you will be able to do so. So from 6 o'clock on, you will be able to watch and enjoy Jamie George in concert. Right now, I'd like to invite him to come forward as he prepares our hearts, as he plays Holy, Holy Holy.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Babylon Rising. And as Eve said, I want to welcome my friends in Babylon, New York. Isn't that great? I've been there. Great place. Tell you something funny about Babylon, New York. It's, it's on Long Island. There's a marina there. It's a, it's a coastal town, a great place. At the marina, at the marina, there's a tall concrete pole. And on top of it, there's an, a lion with eagle's wings, just like the symbol for Babylon in the Bible. Fascinating. Cool place. Glad you're here. Don't forget the concert tonight at 6 o'clock. You'll hear Jamie George, and you'll be so blessed. The concert is live via the World Wide Web as well. So if you're watching from uh, Farmington, Missouri, or College Place, Washington, if you're watching from uh, uh, London, England, or Accra, Ghana, or in Mauritius, you can catch us as well. Now, I don't know, maybe it'll be 1 o'clock in the morning or something, but it'd be worth getting up for. Hope you'll do it. We're going to start this morning with a poll question. We want to hear from you. If you are in the United States, text us. The number you're going to dial is 22333. If you're anywhere in the world, you can Twitter us, tweet us at poll, or you can connect with us via the World Wide Web from www.babylonisrising.com. 
Here's the question. Natural disasters are caused by, now, you could say God or Satan or nature. They just happen. If you're texting, you go to 22333 and text us for God, disaster one. For Satan, disaster two. For nature, they just happen, disaster three. Text us, the number 22333. Tweet us at poll. You'll say either disaster one, for God causes natural disasters. Disaster two, for Satan causes natural disasters. Nature, they just happen, disaster three. And, and you run that together, just, just one, not disaster gap one two three just run it together I want we have some oh well, now that's interesting here's what you were telling us natural disasters are caused by Satan 68% of people are saying that and if that's your answer then you would tell us disaster two. nature they just happen 24% and that's disaster three natural disasters are caused by God 8% of our respondents are saying this. We're doing this in real time. You can, you can do that right here. Take out your phone, and before you check the weather, text us and uh, give us your answer. We'll have another poll coming up, <coughs> oh, not very long. I don't know if it's 20 minutes from now, but partway through our presentation today. And speaking of which, we want to get started with this, and I want to say this to you, seeing as this is the final uh, day of Babylon Rising. Thank you for being part of this. And uh, Yves Monnier spoke earlier about a longer series where we get to go deeper and further. He said it starts January. When did he say it starts? Do you remember? January the 20th. January the 20th. I better know myself because I'll be there for that. And it's being held. I, I, he didn't make this clear. It's being held right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So the best is yet to come. And we're looking forward to you being part of that. And of course, from Las Vegas... This series will go to the world, so wherever you are, you can participate in that as well. Well, let us pray and thank God for this opportunity to be together today. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today that we can come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, here's what we know. We're handling your word. We're handling deep subjects. It has been said, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. We don't want to rush into this. We want to follow your Holy Spirit as you lead us in this study. So, Lord, please do that. And make clear to us your word. Give us eyes to see what we need to see. And hearts and minds that are open to your leading. We thank you for this. And we pray in Jesus' name. Please join me in saying, Amen. Amen. It's interesting, I think, to realize how many commonly used phrases in language today actually come right from the Bible. There's a lot of them. A leopard cannot change its spots. That comes from the Bible. Book of Jeremiah. Um, let me think of another one. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Where does that come from? That comes right from the Bible. Uh, pride goes before a fall. That comes from the Bible. You've heard people being called the salt of the earth. Why like Jesus used that phrase in Matthew chapter 5. That's a, a biblical phrase. All these phrases come from the Bible and many others. The skin of your teeth, that comes from the Bible. And I'm thinking many people don't really even know that a lot of what is said in common language today originates from the Bible. Now, there's another one. You've heard this before. You've heard it said that the writing is on the wall. You've heard that said, right? Sure, that's right. As soon as... The other team scored a touchdown. Well, a writing was on the wall for whoever it was. Once this company launched a new product, the writing was on the wall for all of its competitors. You know what I mean. The writing on the wall, a common phrase, and originally 
drawn from the Holy Bible. And what I find fascinating about this in the context of Babylon rising is that originally this phrase, the writing on the wall, was used in association with the ancient Babylon of the Bible. Let me tell you a little bit more about that. Babylon was such a great and such a powerful kingdom. It, it, it really was dominating the entire planet. Uh, there was nobody on the earth who could come against Babylon and, and overthrow it. It really believed that Babylon was going to last forever. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar wrote, and it was found by archaeologists, where he spoke of Babylon and said, may it last forever. You would not have thought that this great kingdom could ever come to an end. But then, suddenly, literally overnight, this great, this mighty kingdom, Babylon, was swallowed up by a rival nation. Here's how it happened. King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, uh, Belshazzar, was a co-ruler in the kingdom of Babylon. He was home in the palace one night when Babylon came under very heavy enemy attack. But Babylon was so well fortified that the Babylonians felt falsely secure. The attackers were the Medo-Persians, located in what basically we now know today as modern-day Iran. It's interesting how they were able to conquer Babylon. We pick up the story in Daniel chapter 5. It begins in verse 1. Let's look at this from the Word of God. Daniel 5 and verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, his grandfather, same idea, Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple at Jerusalem so that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines, that's his mistresses, might drink therein. Now, it's probably easy for us to fail to see just how significant this really is. Seventy or so years before this event, Nebuchadnezzar had led the armies of Babylon down to Jerusalem. And they had attacked Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, the entire book of Daniel begins by saying this. Daniel 1 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim came Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, a king of Babylon, to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. Now, I want you to notice that he took part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, that's Babylonia, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, notice what happened. Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, and among the spoils of war were the sacred, special vessels or instruments that were used in the temple, in the sanctuary, in the worship of Almighty God. Now, I'm sure you understand, that temple was holy. It was sacred, and Nebuchadnezzar stole the special, precious valuable instruments that were used in the temple to worship God. And he brought them down to Babylon. Those things were very holy in the sight of God. And here's Belshazzar bringing them out at a party. In other words, the holy things of God were used in a drunken, debauched frenzy to honor the devil himself. We read in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 4 these words. They drank wine and praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, of iron, or wood, and of stone. Now what happened next? What happened next when they were doing this? The word of God says the writing was on the wall for Babylon. 
Daniel 5, verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. The next verse says that he was so scared when he saw this. This, this, this hand appearing out of the invisible sleeve of darkness. He was so scared that his knees literally started knocking together. He called all of his counselors together. He said, explain what this mysterious writing means. But they could not. And so they called Daniel, the prophet Daniel, an old man now. Belshazzar called to him and he said, I want you to interpret the writing on the wall. As a matter of fact, it was somebody else there who said, what about Daniel? Remember all that he has done. Maybe he can help. And Daniel came and interpreted the, the writing. He said, Belshazzar, there are four words written there. Well, maybe three words, one repeated. Many, many, tekel, you far seen. Many, many, tekel, you far seen. Now, what in the world did this mean? Daniel was to interpret this writing for the drunken, fearful, panic-stricken king. Many, he said, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and the Persians. At the same time as this was going on, the Medo-Persian army was marching into Babylon. And the Bible says, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about 62 years old. That's what the Bible says. Babylon fell that night. This unconquerable, this mighty, this powerful, world-dominating kingdom fell. And from that time, the great kingdom was no more. Here's the reason for Babylon's demise. Daniel talks to the king about this. And he speaks to Belshazzar, Daniel chapter 5, verses 18 and verse 20. He says to him, the most high God gave your father, God gave your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Now, do you remember what happened? The story talks about how Nebuchadnezzar went out into the wilderness. He was strucken, strucken, strucken. That's how we say it in New Zealand. He was stricken. You know, what, you, know what, you know what the truth is? Here's what I need to say, but I don't want to be offensive. So I know that people in the South have got thick skin. The, tr the truth of the matter is, since I've been in the United States, I've lived almost exclusively in the American South. Make of that what you will. There you go. Not now, but some, some of it hangs over, you know. He was stricken, this king, with a temporary madness. He ate grass like an ox out there in the wilderness, the word of God says. His glory was taken away from him. Now, Daniel says to Belshazzar, and you, his son, O Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought, or you have brought the vessels out of his house before you, and you have drunk wine in them, and you have praised gods of silver and gold and brass and iron and wood and stone. These things that don't see, they don't hear, and they don't even know. And the God is who, and the God in whose hand your breath is. And whose are all your ways you have not glorified. When the Babylonian king took that which was sacred to God, sacred 
in the worship of God and used it instead of for God's glory, he used it for his own glory. In fact, he used it to honor false God, Satan himself. When God's holy worship things were corrupted and compromised, when false worship took the place of true worship, God stepped in and he said, enough is enough. And the writing was on the wall for the kingdom of Babylon, and Babylon fell. Babylon fell. We see around us a world that is in decline. In spite of education and advancement and enlightenment, in spite of all of that, society has regressed. We've gone backwards over the years. Now, I know you're glad for cell phones and computers and dishwashers. and Sure, all right. But we are living in a world where terrorism has come to Main Street. People get involved in embarrassing, high-profile moral scandals. And we reward them with celebrity and status. Environmentally, the world is groaning. It's groaning. Cities are straining. We've got an economy that is barely holding together. What this world needs is a savior. This is a planet in need of a deliverer. This is a world in need of a redeemer. Someone or something who would come and bring security and hope and direction and safety. While the whole world today is wondering what's going to happen next. While people everywhere are looking and wondering which way to turn. Babylon is rising. Satan is is preparing this world to make all the wrong decisions, to turn its back on God. And instead of following the, the, the truth that is contained in the Bible, instead of embracing Jesus who died for the world, instead of faithfully following a loving creator God, this is a world that is being primed. This is a world that is being groomed to accept delusions and deceptions and not truth i want to tell you today though i want to tell you today there is good news two things have got to take place and they must take place soon one the bible says that jesus is going to return and secondly the bible says that babylon will fall now speaking of the return of jesus Speaking of the return of Jesus, I've got another poll question for you. These aren't right or wrong questions. We want to hear back from you and, and find out what you think. Okay, this one here says natural disasters. No, no, that was the first one. A uh, second poll. The return of Jesus will take place. When do you think? First option. Within the next 10 years. Second option. In my lifetime. Third option. Far into the future. Here's how you can participate. Text 22333. If you believe the return of Jesus will take place, uh, tweet us at poll. Go online, babylonisrising.com. If you think the return of Jesus will take place within the next 10 years, say 10 years. That's one zero years. Just all run together. One zero years. If you believe it'll take place in your li lifetime, text us or tweet us or, or contact us online and say lifetime. If you think it's far into the future, 22333 for texting, at poll for Twitter, uh, online, babylonisrising.com. Far into the future, you say, far future. That's what we'd like you to do. So when do you think the return of Jesus will take place? In my lifetime, 72%. Within the next 10 years, 18%. Far into the future, 10%. Now remember... We're just asking your opinion. I'm not going to tell you if you're right or wrong or anything like that. What do you think? Fascinating. In my lifetime, 72%. Within the next 10 years, 18%. Far into the future, just drop down to 9%. The Bible tells us, even though we cannot know exactly when Jesus is coming back, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back. And if we look at the signs of the times as listed in the Word of God, we would have to believe that He's coming back sometime soon. And we know that before He does, the Word of God says,
Babylon will fall. Now we go to Revelation chapter 14. And John writes in Revelation 14 and verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting gospel. The eternal gospel, some translations say. You could call this the final gospel. Now that word gospel, we say that that means what? Good news. So whatever the angel has, and angels representing a messenger, whatever the messenger has to say, it's got to be what? Good news, because it's the gospel. All right. The angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. I want you to see God says the whole world will hear this message. God will give everybody the opportunity to hear and understand and make a decision. Now, the first angel says this, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And notice what it says now, worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In other words, there is a call to worship the true God, a call to worship the creator God. You know that we know God is the true God because God made the things that other gods are made out of. God, the creator God, is the true God. And this gives glory to Christ. Because if you read in John 1, if you read in Colossians 1, you realize that it was Jesus who actively created the world and all that is in it. That's what the Bible says. Well, now we look at this in context. Before Christ returns, there is a call to the world to worship the creator God. At the same time as that, there is a created being who is saying, no, don't do that. Instead, worship me. Don't worship the creator. Instead, worship the creature. Satan is endeavoring to take God's place and receive the worship that belongs only to God. And he's trying to keep you and me from being connected with God. He knows that if we are connected with God, his plan fails and we are safe. He wants to bring pain to the heart of God by separating people from God, by leading people to trust not God but in themselves, not the Bible but something else. And right at about that time, in the Word of God, there is another call. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. The second angel says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The fall of ancient Babylon was unexpected. And in just the same way, you wouldn't expect modern Babylon to fall. We read in the Bible, she is so powerful. She is called Babylon the Great, the one who says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. But she falls. She believes she cannot. She states that she will not, but she does. And the Word of God says, Babylon is fallen. Now think for a moment. What precipitated the fall of ancient Babylon? The rulers took that which was holy to God and desecrated it, corrupted it, and, and, and used it to, to rebel against God. They made an openly defiant stand against the things that God called sacred. In the same way, modern Babylon will strike against that which is holy to God. Now, way back in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, you read about something 
called a little horn, joined at the hip with Babylon. Call it the same thing. The Word of God says that this thing cast the truth down to the ground. Also, we're told in Daniel 7 and verse 25 that it would think to change times and laws. So in the end of time, there's something warring against God's truth. There's something that would even attack the authority of the law of Almighty God. This is something that says, you live as you please. Don't live how God pleases. You satisfy self. You don't have to surrender to God. Satan has been telling these lies for thousands of years. Has it helped us or hindered us? Has it helped us to grow better as a society? Or have we been going down, down, deeper into the mire of sin? Satan's plan has not made this world a better place on any level. Just look around the world. People are so enlightened now that they don't even have time for God. The rulers and politicians and societies leave God out of their thinking. And it's not as though things are getting any better as a result. This world's getting worse without God and Babylon. This tool through which the enemy of God works is said finally in the Word of God to have fallen. The fact of the matter is the Word of God says that eventually, it says that eventually Babylon receives the cup of the wine of the fierceness of God's wrath. Ultimately, the seven last plagues will fall. And everybody who has chosen in their heart to reject God and to reject God's guidance receives those seven last plagues and they will be lost and not saved. Now, as I say that, I can just imagine somebody saying, oh, how could God be so hateful? How could God be so mean? Why would God do that to people? Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. God created the world to bless people. God put you here to bless you, to make you happy, to elevate you, to give you the desires of your heart as they are in harmony with that which is truly good or right. The Bible says that God wants to be our rock, our source of blessing, our stay. In fact, it says in the Word of God that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. That's what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 9, God says of old Babylon, He says this, We would have healed her, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. God was even trying to save the Babylonians. That's why He did what He did for King Nebuchadnezzar. That's why he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go mad and go out into the wilderness. Because it was maybe Nebuchadnezzar's best opportunity to recognize that fighting against God was folly. And embracing God was the right thing to do. Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked man, a vicious man, a murderous tyrant. Nebuchadnezzar's heart was melted by the grace of God. As far as we can tell from the Bible... This man died a saved man. You're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in glory. Someone going to tell me that God is against people, mean to people, hurting people. He chased down Nebuchadnezzar until Nebuchadnezzar yielded and said, you know, it's best to go God's way. God's in the business of bringing salvation. God's in the business of bringing blessing. God's in the business of lifting people up and filling their lives with his presence. Jesus will come to you today. He'll come to everybody. He would wish that everybody in Las Vegas and everybody around the world would say yes to God, offer God their sin-polluted heart, and accept from God righteousness and strength and Holy Spirit guidance. God will save you. Anyone who comes to him in faith, there's a spiritual crisis we're in.
a spiritual battle that's raging in our homes and in our streets and in our societies. Before it's over, the world will hear the call of a messenger from Revelation to worship Christ the Creator. And when people get to the place that they finally reject God's Lordship, finally reject the things that are important to God, make a decision in their hearts to go their own way and trample on the things of God, a message will go out to the world that says, Babylon is fallen. What God wants to do is bless us and save us. My friend, I hope you know today. I hope you know today. I hope you know today that it's God's plan, God's desire to bless you and save you. You see, ultimately, there will be two groups of people. One group lost, led by Babylon. <coughs> Deceived by the enemy, they receive ultimately the mark of the beast. The saved, the forgiven, have simply made the decision to let God be who he says he is. Simple. They've said, if you're really God, then come right into my life and be God in my life. And they receive the seal of God. And they're ready for the greatest event since the creation of the world and that is the return to this world of Jesus Christ ever since are you looking forward to that ever since the human family fell into sin Jesus has been planning to return to this earth and ransom us and redeem us and finally and forever save us from our sins. One day soon, the word of God is clear. Jesus will return. Today, Babylon is rising. But ultimately, Babylon falls because love wins out. Faith wins out. Truth triumphs. Evil cannot win in the end. God's word triumphs in this spiritual crisis. If you hang on to the word of God, you triumph too as God's grace draws you. Friend, I've got to tell you, I believe this deep, deep, deep in my being. There is hope for this world today. It's a world that is teetering on the brink of absolute disintegration, but there is hope for this world today in spite of this world having gone awry this is a time for faith on our part this is a time to trust in God and trust in a God that all the powers of hell cannot overcome Jesus is coming back to the world it is said that it is darkest just before dawn well that tells me Jesus coming back soon cause it's pretty dark out there right now there's a bright dawn coming. Friend, is the return of Jesus your hope today? Now, I want to say something to you. I don't want anybody thinking that God isn't interested in you. This is no time to be thinking that. And, and, and you might be saying, no, I, I cannot imagine that Jesus would actually die for me. There are people who think they're too bad to save. Well, I have a word for you today. Jesus didn't come to this world to save the good folks who didn't need a savior. Jesus came to this world to save the needy. He came for the sinners. He came for people like me. So low down there, the only place I could look was up. And I looked up and I saw Jesus reaching down with that long arm of love. Jesus reaching out with that outstretched hand. And faith grabbed hold of that. And Jesus lifted me up. You think you are too weak? Hold on a second. The Bible says, my strength is made perfect in weakness if there's weakness in you then there's something that God can save one of my favorite verses in the Bible and, and, and I don't even like making that statement but it's this verse Philippians 2 and verse 13 where it says for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure if you can trust in God if you can look beyond the madness and the mayhem, if you can look beyond a faltering economy and a broken planet 
if you can look beyond everything Satan is doing, all his manipulations and all of his conspiracies, if you can look beyond how he's manipulating people to turn their back on God, if you can look beyond that and look to Jesus, then you can know that Jesus is going to return and end the manipulating and end the madness and end the conspiracies and end the grief and end the guilt and end the shame. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 says, Come out of her, my people. You know what I love about that? This thing, Babylon, full of sin, full of wickedness, full of craziness. And what does God say to the people there? Come out of her who? Oh, friend, isn't God good that people who are in over their heads in madness and sin, God can see past the outside and God can see the heart and he sees in people all over the world, these are my people. Christ died for you. Come out and be safe in the arms of Jesus forever. Thank God today. Amen. Let's keep this simple. All you need to do to come out of Babylon, let's keep this simple. If you will make a decision to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, now I'm not talking about some surface thing, but if you'll be straight enough with God to say, Lord, I, I just want you to take all of me. If, now listen, if you can look at your life and say, I've rejected God, and I've rejected salvation, and I just think I'm happier this way, what can I say? But if there is something in your heart that answers to the call of God, and if you can say, Lord, I want this thing called salvation. I want this man called Jesus. I want to go it your way. Please lead me and live your life in me. I don't believe you have much to fear for the future. If you will say, Lord, come into my life, God will bring all of us so far out of Babylon, we never even look back. It's possible there's someone here today who may not even know it, that the God of the Bible loves you and wants everlasting life for you. He's able to forgive any sin, take away all the guilt, get rid of all the shame. He can give the peace that passes understanding. He can give that right now. I would like today to give you an opportunity to accept from God his wonderful gift of salvation and grace. Thank you, my ushers, who are going to come down to the front right now. If you're at the end of a row, you're going to have a little bucket put in your hand. Please take one card out of that bucket and pass the rest along. You know something? I would like you to participate in this for several reasons. Um, one is there's something on this card for everybody. There's a way that you can make a decision for God today. The writing on the wall. There are five little statements here. I'm going to read through them with you. Please take the card, pass it along if you need something to write with. I think there's a pencil in that bucket as it comes by. You know, I'm not asking you to make any obligation here. Just a decision for Jesus. Number one. I choose to accept Jesus as my personal savior. Number two says, I believe God forgives me and makes my life new. Number three, I want to be ready to meet Jesus when he returns. Number four, I want more information on this subject. Number five, I have Bible questions I would like answered. There's something I should have put on this card, forgive me. If you want me to pray for you, put a big P right on this card. That's P for prayer. You can write your prayer request if you want. You don't have to. And then put down your name so I know who I'm praying for. Put down some contact details. We'll know how to get study information to you. While you pray about your decision for Jesus, Jamie is going to come forward. As he does so, as he plays, allow God to speak to your heart. I encourage you to make today a decision for Jesus. Thank you, Jamie.
I'd like uh, you to uh, pass that bucket back along the, the aisle, the row somewhere, and as you do that, put that card back in. Hope the ushers are giving you time to do that. If you need a receptacle to put your cards in, then just, just do this. I, I want to pray for you. I'll pray for you personally. And, uh, and I'm encouraged that today you had an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to go it your way. So thanks, ushers, for being sure that the buckets get back by so that everybody with a card, I even see one down here, someone's not getting... Uh, not getting it back in. So I'm just, I'm trusting my ushers that you'll get around and do all the diligent effort you need to do to make sure that you've taken those cards back. Not want to ask someone to have, uh, I'll pray for them and, and, and message doesn't get to me, so let, let the message get to me. We've got some questions that we're going to do in our last few minutes today. Is there any significance to the fact that a hand wrote those words on the wall as opposed to them just appearing there? Yes, there is. Uh, Ten Commandments, did they just appear or were they what? This was, this, was, this was to let people know this was the hand of God. Now, God could have made them just appear. Sure, he could have. But there was added significance there. And also, they witnessed a hand. If they just turned around and saw writing on a wall, that is said, who did that? But they all saw a hand doing it, and people knew this was God. You mentioned an economic crisis that will affect millions of people, and that was Randall in Oregon. Thank you. Millions of people. How soon, uh, how soon do you think that by the end of 2011 or beginning of 2012, our economy will collapse? Let me give you a really definite answer. I'm not in the business of making predictions. I know what we know. Jesus is coming back. I know that. I know it's going to happen. The Bible says it's going to happen. Look around the world. It looks like it could happen any time, but I don't know. People have been saying that for a while. You know what the key is? Live like it might happen today. And that doesn't mean go crazy and freak out. That means be certain that your heart and God's heart are connected. If your heart is connected with the heart of God and Jesus didn't come back for another 300 years, are you hurt by that? You've lived a full life. If your heart is connected with the heart of God and, you, and Jesus returns next week, hey, good news, you're ready. So we don't need to worry about uh, the timing. Uh, even the Bible says that the times and the seasons, you don't need to worry about. Paul said that. It's a good question, though. Please explain what is meant by the great delusion placed upon man that they should believe a lie. This is 2 Thessalonians 2. It says God will send them strong delusion. That's not saying God's going to fool you or deceive you. That's simply saying that when you have truth and you reject it and believe something else, that becomes the strong delusion for you. It's like saying 
God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God didn't make it impossible for Pharaoh to be saved. Instead, he sent Pharaoh light. And when Pharaoh saw the light and turned his back on it, his heart was hardened. Similar idea with the strong delusion in the book of Revelation. Why is it that Daniel saw the beasts of Daniel 7 coming from the sea? In Daniel chapter 7. I saw that a moment ago. Uh, can you pop that up? Even if you can't, I know what it says because I saw it. Why did Daniel say the beasts came out of the sea? The angels said they came out of the earth. Because Daniel was writing about what he saw in vision. And then the angel was interpreting that to him. The angel still said beasts, but later on the angel said these great beasts are for kingdoms. A beast is a kingdom. Remember that from last night. And these kingdoms came out of the earth. Before we go, I want to pray with you and ask God's richest blessing. And thank you for your questions, by the way. Friends, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, you have blessed us again and we are thankful. Fill us with your spirit. Keep us in the center of your will. And Lord, be the Lord of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so very much for joining us for Babylon Rising. May God bless you richly. Thank you so much.